All right, shall we proceed with the conversation this evening? Great. I'll say a quick welcome. Um, my name is Katie Natanel, and I'm here on behalf of the Exeter Decolonizing Network, um, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and the European Center for Palestine Studies, who have come together to host um, tonight's conversation and also the series that started last year and has carried into this year. So just a few words about the work that we're doing. Um, we've come together as again, kind of three initiatives and three communities to create spaces for dialogue and diagnosis and radical change, beginning with the question of Palestine. And last year um, we welcomed amazing guests and speakers, um, comrades and colleagues from starting with Angela Davis in January and ending with Paul Gilroy, um, I think it was in May or June. And we started again this time um, in January, just last month, we had Mustafa Barghouti. And tonight we're thrilled um, and honored to be welcoming um, Elias Houri to speak with us this evening. So we're here to listen and to learn as ever, um, to think and to act and to imagine and to build and to be together in struggle um, as well as being together in community. I'm going to hand over to the two chairs for the evening, your hosts um, in this conversation, but I'm also going to start a live transcription, which enables those of us who are here on Zoom inside the call to have access to subtitling. Um, this will be running across the bottom of your screen. And just so you know, if you've not worked with it before, you will also have a menu bar at the bottom of the screen that says live transcript. And if you don't want to see the subtitles, you can simply click on the arrow to the right and hide the, the subtitles for the duration of the evening. But this is here um, to increase our access to the, to the full audience who's with us this evening. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our hosts for the evening, um, Tina and Briar. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Katie, um, and hello and welcome to everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all and a real privilege for me to be chairing this event tonight. So I am um, Tina Phillips and I am a professor of comparative and Arabic literature at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. And I'm delighted um, to be chairing this evening with one of our most impressive PhD students at the Institute, Bria Bajalan, who I will leave to introduce himself. Thank you, Tina. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you uh, for being here with us today. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to welcome you today in, um, in this talk with uh, Elias Khoury. Uh, I'm Briar Bajalan. I'm a writer and um, translator and filmmaker, presently pursuing my PhD in the Arabic and Islamic Studies uh, Department at the University of Exeter. And my present uh, projects include translation of poets displaced from Shingal and during the Islamic State genocide of the Yazidis and a collection of oral histories from Mosul. Um, and I'm very excited uh, to, to be part of this talk. Uh, so I'll hand it to Katie. No, no, to me. Um, back back oh, to me. Thank you. Thank so you, Bria. Back to you. Um, no, no, that's great. And, um, <laughs> I just want to, before we begin, to um, thank a few people. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank our hosts and sponsors, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies here at Exeter, the European Centre for Palestine Studies here at Exeter, and the Exeter Decolonising Network. So thank you to them. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the individuals who've been involved in bringing this event to fruition and also who are now working behind the scenes to kind of keep things running smoothly. Um, among them, Asha Ali, Sarah Roberts, Malcolm Richards, Nadia Khalaf, Andrea Wallace, Sajad Rizvi, Gareth Stansfield, Katie Natanel, and Sarah Wood. So thank you to all of you. Um, I'd also like to thank you guys, our audience, for taking the time to spend this evening with us from wherever you are on the globe um, via Zoom and YouTube. It's very nice to see everyone um, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank Bria, my co-chair um, and wonderful PhD student. And of course, I'd like to thank our speakers, Professor Ilan Pape and Elias Khoury. Um, so the programme for tonight is um, fairly simple. We've got 45 minutes of um, conversation between our two speakers, followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. Um, and I'm going to hand back to Briar to explain the ground rules. Yeah, so uh, the ground rules uh, for this uh, meeting. Um, so for those with us on Zoom, uh, please keep your microphones muted during the event. Uh, cameras may be uh, 
or on off as you wish. Um, comments and questions are invited through the chat function on Zoom and YouTube and via the hashtag, uh, hashtag Hori Pape 2022. Um, please communicate with uh, kindness and respect uh, as you would in person. Um, this continues to be a difficult time marked by anxiety and loose. Uh, how we speak matters. Uh, please note that the event will be recorded. Uh, you are welcome to change your name uh, if you wish to remain uh, anonymous. Um, during the question and A, uh, we will use screen names to identify the speakers. Thank you. I'll thank you, Brielle, thank you. you. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Ilan Pepe. So Ilan um, is a professor of history at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and he is the director of the European Center for Palestine Studies here at Exeter. Ilan is an expatriate Israeli historian and socialist activist. He's one of the new historians who, since the release of British and Israeli government documents in the early 1980s, have been rewriting the history of Israel's creation in 1948. Ilan's research contextualizes the history of Palestine into a larger global context of settler colonialism and challenges the dominant Israeli narrative. Ilan, as many of us know, has been involved in many campaigns and actions over the years, and most recently became a founding member of the new movement, the One Democratic State Initiative. Ilan is, of course, the author of several important books, um, including um, and that is the long list, but I'm going, to, I'm going to give a few of them. Um, a History of Modern Palestine, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, The Israel-Palestine Question, The Forgotten Palestinians, A History of Palestinians in Israel, The Idea of Israel, A History of Power and Knowledge, and The Biggest Prison on Earth, A History of the Occupied Territories, which received the prestigious Palestine Book Award in, 19, in 2016. Ilan has also written um, two books with um, the famous Noam Chomsky, the first of them, Gaza in Crisis, published 2011, and the second of them, On Palestine, published in 2015. Um, in addition to this kind of impressive, but hugely, hugely abbreviated bio, and on a more personal note, Ilan is a much loved friend, colleague, and mentor to many of us at the Institute. In my 10 years at IAS, I've seen how Ilan's activism and generosity as a as an intellectual and teacher have inspired students and colleagues alike and I've personally learned a lot from his work. Ilan, it's always very exciting to hear you speak and I'm looking forward to the next hour and a half. Over to you Bria for, um, for the second speaker please. Thank you Tina, I think that's very true. <laughs> um, so I'll introduce you to Elias Khoury, um, he's a global distinguished professor at uh, New York University. Uh, is a public intellectual who plays a major role in Arabic cultural sense and in the defense of the liberty of expression and democracy. Uh, and he's a cultural activist who directed the Theater of Beirut and co-directed the Eilul Festival of Modern Arts in Beirut. His academic career includes his work as a professor at Columbia University, the Lebanese University, the American University of Beirut and the Lebanese American University. He began his career as literary critic with his book, uh, Searching for a Horizon, the Arabic novel after the defeat of 1967, uh, published in 1974. Professor Khoury then published his first novel on the relations of the circle, 1975, and became part of the Beirut vanguard in modern Arabic literature. He served on the editorial board uh, of Mawaqif Quarterly, and as the managing editor of Shu'un Palestinia, Palestinian Affairs, and of Karamel uh, Kwatli. Professor Khoury uh, has published 12 novels, which have been translated into numerous languages, four books of literary criticism, and many articles and reviews. Uh, he's also known as a playwright, and his three plays have been uh, performed in Beirut, Paris, L Berlin, Vienna, and Basel. Professor Khoury, has participated in writing two films, and he worked as a journalist serving as director and editor-in-chief Mulhaq, the weekly literary supplement of the Al Nahar Daily in Beirut. Uh, and uh, I first came across the, uh, Professor Khoury's uh, work, uh, Babisham's, uh, as I was translating uh, 
seven emerging Yazidi poets who uh, survived the, um, the Islamic State genocide against the Yazidi community in Iraq. Uh, and I really could relate and love the way uh, Professor Khouli uh, went in into the everyday life of uh, refugee camps and 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 the way like the, um, the poets fled ISIS and into the desert with with droughtness with uh, a lack of food dehydration and all this stuff uh, I could very much relate it to 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 your work and and really enjoyed uh, your work and it was a very important piece uh, to be so thank you so much and it's a pleasure to be with you here today thank you Okay, so, so pass it to Dr. Ilan Pepe. Great, thank you so much, everyone, for taking part of this. Thank you so much, Elias, for taking the time and the trouble to be with us uh, and uh, providing us with the opportunity uh, to discuss issues which are close to you and our heart. Uh, we will talk about Palestine and its place in the conversations about decolonization. Uh, we will talk, I hope, if we have enough time, about the left, the public intellectuals, and uh, about gender. Again, if time permits, to cover so many topics I would have liked to discuss with you. But I would like to begin with a question or two about uh, Lebanon, your home country. Uh, the civil war in Lebanon uh, uh, traumatized the Lebanese uh, society, and it seemed also it scarred your own biography and life. Uh, it seems to be more than just an event with a closure, and it appears much more as a structure, almost an unwelcome part of a nation's DNA, which you can soothe at times, but never really cure. In broken mirrors situated in what is known as allegedly the post-war period, when 15 years of civil war uh, in Lebanon seem to be over, as readers, we get the sense that the war trickles on and on. It does not end in your novels, regardless of whether we are able to identify the period they are set in or not. It is far more a cyclic history than a linear one, very much a state of mind that characterizes the biographies and trajectories of some of the troubled families and couples in your novels, navigating uneasily uh, a seemingly unbridgeable relationship and yet managing uh, to live together. War and conflict or conflict in general, it seems for you are timeless events that are dominated by what scholars like to call temporality, something that Palestinians of all people too well uh, know too well what that means, and I will return to the temporality later on, is what unfolds in Lebanon today part of this cyclic history, or is it a new chapter, as there are no killing fields of actual war as such, instead there is an economic and political crisis that seems to wreak disintegration, and permanent uncertainty, or is it still part of the never-ending crisis, and is there any hope? for a different future uh, for Lebanon. And thank you again for, for the time and trouble, Elias. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Ilan. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm really privileged to be with you and to hear uh, such uh, a deep uh, analysis and questions from my friend, uh, who's a great historian, from whom I learned a lot, and I'm still learning a lot. Uh, uh, but the question actually is, is very difficult for me uh, uh, because I am, I am, he's referring to the novel. Broken Mirror is a novel. And, and I want, to, first of all, to, to sign out that, uh, that uh, the civil war, which began in 1975, liberated literature in a way or another. That is, uh, the Lebanese uh, literary scene was dominated by this romantic, nostalgic uh, poetry, uh, music, uh, Fayrouz, Rahbani, uh, 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 about a, a unified, reconciliated country, 
uh, with nothing to, to do with the, the, the present time. Now, the Civil War uh, gave us, gave me and then my generation up with me, since I published uh, Rocky Mountain in 1977 in Arabic, uh, the opportunity to destroy the dominant language and to open the literary scene uh, on what I call uh, uh, writing the present. But when we write the present, the present in itself incarnates the past, and in it there are elements of the future. You cannot try the present of a civil war, which took place in 1975, without remembering a civil war, which happened in the 19th century, uh, in 1860, 20 years. It took place for 20 years. And, and, and actually, after that civil war, the Mutasarifiya, that is the embryo of modern Lebanon, was, was, was created by the seven European powers which were the dominant powers at that time. Uh, 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 what, what, is, what is interesting, what I discovered was very interesting that the first civil war was never mentioned by the writers of the time and of the time that came later, who were great writers, who were the major innovator of, 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 of Arabic language uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century like Ahmad Feres Shibyaq, the others, and so on and so forth. And that there was a kind of feeling shame from going back to a shameful event like the Civil War. But actually, this doesn't solve the problem. Uh, uh, without facing reality, without facing the present with open eyes, we cannot, I think we cannot write. We cannot really produce uh, literature, and what the civil war gave was, this is my, my this is my hypothesis and my theory, the emergence of the Lebanese novel began with the civil war. Before the civil war, we had novelists, of course, very great, big names and so on, but we didn't have a movement. Poetry was totally dominant. With the civil war, the prose emerged, and 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 the stories of the present emerged. And the new literature was was in the in the in the in the process of being uh, uh, created. Um, now, when I said spoke about the nineteenth century civil war, uh, and you, have, you can see this in my novels also, uh, this doesn't mean we are in a cyclic situation. But also, this doesn't mean we are in a linear situation. Neither cyclic. Is a, uh, is a real, is, a, is, is a, an accurate interpretation, nor linear and going all the time towards the future, towards the, bet the best, the better is, 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 uh, is an adequate answer. We are in this combination of the demons that were created in a, 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 a special historical circumstances and were recreated in the 1970s in another circumstances. And they are, we can say, we can speak about a kind of continuity, but there is a whole, a big rupture between them. There is a big rupture between the civil war as part, as it was in the, in the, in the early 70s, 75 and 75, as part of the Palestinian struggle for the liberation of Palestine and a civil war which continued after 1982, which was a totally savage, as Marx, you know, Marx, uh, Marx spoke, had one sentence about the Lebanese civil war of the 19th century. He spoke about the savage tribes of Lebanon. Uh, uh, these savage tribes came back, or, or there is a new form of this savagery. So uh, it's not a destiny. The civil war is not our destiny, but the civil war is our, is our condition now because a small country like Lebanon, surrounded by, by, uh, by, by dictatorships all over. On one hand, we have uh, Syria, 
with its uh, with its uh, cannot, يعني, you know you know better than me about them, but what 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 the Syrian regime and and the dictatorship of Syria did to the Syrian people first, and then to the Lebanese people, and by Israel, and we need not to speak about what what Israel created in the region and mainly this idea of identity based upon religion. This is something, the identity based upon religion, and I'll go back, I'll go now to your second question, Ina. This idea of, of identity based upon, upon religion is new, is modern. It's not an old story. Now, before I give you the floor, I want just to, uh, to, to mention that um, I'm no more the editor in chief of the literary supplement of Anahar since uh, since uh, 12 years. I am now the editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies, which is a quarterly published in Arabic in Beirut by the by the by the Institute of Palestine Studies, where uh, we publish to Ilan uh, from time to time when he's generous enough to give us articles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Elias, yes, you, you referred to my quest, the second question. I, I would, would like to come back to this in a moment now. Um, be, because of this uh, sense, uh, and, and may, maybe I will just tell the viewers, those who are not familiar, that the clash, uh, if I'm not wrong, in 1860 was the kind of framed as a clash between uh, 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 Maronites and, uh, and Druze communities. At least that's how it appeared in Western Yes. Uh, perspective, but I think there was also a social class issue between landowners and, 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 and farmers and so on. Looking at such a history, as, as you put it, that is both not cyclic, but also not linear, both has continuity, but also has dramatic uh, uh, ruptures, as, as you put it, and rightly so. Uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, uh, the term, which I also, I know we talked about it ourselves, but I would like to share this with our viewers, of sectarianism. Uh, uh, we are having this conversation, uh, as Katie mentioned, and the others who organized it, uh, uh, under the auspices, among uh, other uh, institutions, of the uh, 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 Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, which is definitely one of the most important centers for Middle Eastern studies. And one of the issues we are academically deliberating is sectarianism. We feel that it is usually employed in particular in the context of Lebanon, but not only there, it's also true about Iraq and Syria, especially after uh, recent events. Uh, and it, it can appear as a classical, you know, orientalist reductionist framing of Arab history and culture as a brutal political timeline and space where groups are pitted one against the other in a constant conflict. And this historical view is used usually to provide a very superficial explanation for the violence, the political violence mainly uh, in places such as Lebanon, as well as a pretext for colonial and later imperial intervention in the past. Is there a better way of looking at confessional affiliations, a group identities uh, of uh, uh, the Mashraq, the Eastern Mediterranean mosaic human map? Maybe the past legacy with positive human attributes of live and let live as part of the fact of life where you have, you know, ecumenical frames, people have their group identities, and yet this is only part of life not the only part of life. And can, can this view of uh, a mosaic where group where people are also defined by group identities or, or sects can play a positive role today and maybe tomorrow in the future of Lebanon or beyond, or really is it a negative, I don't know, feature of life in the Eastern Mediterranean that somehow has to be mitigated uh, in order to move to a more pacified uh, present and future. Uh, 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 Ilan, I want to tell you a, a, a story which is very, very uh, significant. After the French uh, dominated Lebanon and Syria with the Saxe-Picot agreements and so on, 
the French and the French mandate, they, they used to call it mandate. It was, it was uh, typical colonialism, but uh, anyway. Uh, uh, what the French tried to do was to create uh, uh, five states in Syria. They created a state for the Druze uh, in, 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 in Jabal al-Arab, the, the Mount of the Druze, as we call it now. They created a, a, a state for the Alawites in the north, in Ladipiya, and up. And they created two states for the Sunnis, one in Damascus and one in Aleppo. And the fifth state was the Greater Lebanon. They called Greater Lebanon, which is very small, but anyway, they called it Greater. Uh, now, the only state that survived was Lebanon because in Lebanon, there was the embryo of what we call confessional sectarian political structure was built since the 19th century. Whereas in Syria, this structure was not there. I'm not saying that people at that time or people were, did not feel affiliation to their, to their different communities, but this affiliation was not part of their national identity. It was not part of the national identity. This is why the four states in Syria failed by the will of the Syrians, not, not by any, any force. What we are witnessing now is something modern, which is related to modernism, to this type of modernism of the colonial, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the political, economical structure that, and, and of the dictatorships that came after the end of colonialism in the Arab, in the Arab East. <clears throat> what we are witnessing now is structuring loyalties according to sector, to, to, to different confessions. And, and this is fabricated, you know, when, when we speak about, about a nation, is, the nation is a fabricated issue, right? We, we invent a nation. This is an invented process. This doesn't mean, as I said, we do not, we do not have uh, different affiliations. Uh, and, and, and actually, actually in, 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 in this part of the world, like anywhere in the world, but in here in the Arab East, it is much more clear no one has one identity. You know, having one identity means you are a fascist. We have multiple layers of identities. And this has nothing, this is a richness, this is not poorness. This doesn't lead automatically to civil wars and to savagery and to, and to massacre. This can lead there if there is a structure which is pushing them forward. I, the, the, the Syrian regime, the Syrian dictatorship, tried, tried to, 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 to dominate Syria through using one of the, of the Syrian communities against the other community, through the, using a minority against the majority. Uh, uh, the same thing happened in Iraq, by the way, but vice versa. And, and, and this is the Ba'as party, which is the catastrophe that happened to the Arab world. You know, once uh, I, I read that in Israel, they were creating a party called Hatahya, which uh, meant al Ba'as. I was so happy. I said, like the Ba'as ended the Arabs, Hatahya will end Israel, but it didn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, 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 this is an in invented. And, 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 and what we are witnessing now, and then it comes to, 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 to levels of savagery with the Iraqi thing, with the with Daesh and with what happened to the to the Yazidis and and what it what happened to the Christians of Mosul, by the way, and what happened to the to the Christian community in Iraq under the Americans, you know these Americans came to Iraq and and the first outcome was the immigration of of Iraqi Christians, and they came with with uh, with the preachers and and <laughs> with the ten. <laughs> Commandment. It's fascinating and it's terrible. So what I'm saying is that we can go beyond this. This is something very new. This is not eternal. In our history, this never this didn't happen like that. There were okay fractions, there were civil wars, but it, it we can analyze it in totally different way 
even if it took the shape of ideology or religion and so on and so forth, so forth, it was revolts against the central government and so on. Whereas now we are witnessing something totally new, totally modern, which is trying, which is actually threatening not our our national unities only, but threatening our personal identities. Mm-hmm. We are threatened to become stupid fascists. Uh, you know, the, the worst thing I can I can imagine is once I was in, in France and someone introduced me as a Christian. I told them, please, please, please. <laughs> I'm not a Christian. Who told you I'm a Christian? I come from a Christian family, but I'm not Christian. Yeah, that's political are, identity, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not my identity. My identity, I'm Lebanese, I'm Arab. Say I'm a Palestinian now. Now uh, everybody thinks I'm Palestinian and I'm 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 uh, I am proud of this. Uh, so we can, you and me, become our Palestinians without being Palestinians. Of our Palestinians. This is, of course. <laughs> so this is how this is how I I I, I figure out uh, things, and this is how I write. Actually, this is how I see I see this mul- multi- multiple identities in my novels. Mm-hmm. There is someone whose mother is who's Muslim, who is a, 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 who was in the Jihad Muqaddas in the in the, in the 30s. Uh, uh, in Palestine, whose mother is Christian, and 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 and, and for him, uh, Saint Mary uh, is is part of, of his of his culture. So this is how I, I I I think our identity is, and this can be of a great richness, on one condition, of course, to become serious about our destinies, yeah, yeah, and and to change this uh, bottomless bottom that we are uh, entering. I, I find it fascinating, and I, I wanted to ask you in this, in this respect, because you write, I'm thinking one, one passage in your, in your novel that I think uh, relates to this, and, and, and I think although it is something about an individual's version of his or her own history, I think is allegorically also uh, uh, refers to, to, to what we are talking about. And I'm thinking uh, a particular uh, uh, on Babel Shams, the gate of the sun, where Halil uh, says uh, uh, to Yunus that he's scared of history that has only one version. And I think I have the, the, the full just paragraph, I think, for our viewers. I think this is, a, for me, it's a brilliant articulation of the point. History has dozens of versions. And for it to ossify into only one leads only to death. We must not see ourselves only in their mirror, for they are prisoners of one story, as though that story had abbreviated and ossified them. We must not become just one story. I see you as a man who betrays and repents and loves and fears and dies. This is the only way if we are not to ossify and die. Now, of course, this also relates to to his personal life, but I think this is the kind of philosophy and your, what shall I say, kind of a gut reaction to uh, a reductionist politics of identity, which I totally agree with you. This are not, it's not a continuation of the mosaic of the past. It's a modern uh, creation uh, and a very uh, uh, deadly one. Uh, I, I, I would like to, to as we, we mentioned, uh, we are all uh, a little bit Palestinians as well. So let, let me move just to Palestine here. Um, there are many efforts, uh, or let, let me uh, begin by, by reminding our viewers that um, since you were 19 years old, uh, you were deeply involved in the Palestinian liberation uh, movement and in Palestinian cultural life. Uh, so I, I have uh, a quick, uh, I hope, uh, questions. We, we have time on, on Palestine. Uh, there are currently many efforts and initiatives to reformulate the PLO uh, or replace it. Uh, the fragmentation caused by the Nakba and by subsequent events created different Palestinian constituencies with different agendas. And, and now it seems that the younger uh, Palestinian generation uh, is looking for a way forward to be guided out of the present deadlock, hopefully by a new democratic and uh, representative leadership. 
Uh, first of all, I want to ask, are you involved in these kinds of contemplations? Uh, and even if you are not, what are your views on the future uh, political structure that will carry on or may have the ability to carry on the liberation, the Palestinian liberation struggle forward in, uh, in this century? Yes, uh, 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 Ilan, I was, uh, I, wa I was, and I, 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 I think I'm still a militant, but I was never a politician, a political politician. So don't don't expect from me a political answer in, in the in the in the narrow in the narrow uh, concept of politics. Uh, uh, since you referred to Yunus and Web Shams and Get of the Sun, uh, I want to remind you that Yunus, after the defeat of 1967, there's a scene where Yunus is in the camp and he stood and he said to everybody, Manil Awal, from the beginning, we have to begin again. And I think we are now in a moment which is very similar to that moment. We need a new beginning. This is what I feel. This is what is vibrating in, in, in my eyes and in my soul. This is, this is what, what, I, what I felt when Basil Araj uh, was assassinated by the Israelis. This is what I felt uh, last week when the three, the three uh, youngsters from Nablus were assassinated. This is what, what I felt when, uh, when the six prisoners came out from the Jalbua uh, prison uh, through a tunnel. I think we need a new beginning. And the new beginning, I don't, I don't believe that in history we can, if there, is some, you know, if there is something which died, we can revive it. Revival can only be done by, by gods who are not gods, who are human beings. In history, there is no revival. In history, there are beginnings. And I think we are in a moment. The beginning must be from the base. That is, from the struggle and resistance against the occupation and against apartheid and, 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 and against the closed national uh, identitarian, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, discourse. A struggle for a free Palestine, a democratic Palestine, uh, 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 where, the, where the Palestinians have the right to return, where, where we, can, we can hope for, for a future to the Palestine, to the children and the grandchildren and the grand grandchildren of the refugees who have been through hell since seventy four years. Uh, uh, this is how I, this is how I feel. So a new beginning. In this beginning, I try to be part of the debate. You know, and we are old now, Khalas. <laughs> we are no more. We are no more. Uh, 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 we, we no more fit for the struggle. But for the technical struggle, which, we, we, which I did when I was young. But I think struggle has many forms. And one of its forms is writing. And one of its forms is literature. I think Palestine now is literature. Now we come to, to a very problematic question. I think that in, 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 the, in, the, in the artistic, uh, pluralistic perspective, Palestine has a special place because it is not only because uh, I love the Palestinians. Actually, I love the Palestinians uh, not for national reasons, by the way. I love the Palestinians because I, I, did, I, I, I identify with the victim. And here you have a situation where till now there is colonization, there is apartheid, and there are uh, colonies, they call them settlements. Their technical name, name is colonies, they are not settlements. Uh, this, is an, it, it, this is a technical error which most of us uh, uh, do it from time to time. So this is what I, what is what I think. I, I don't have any hope in the leadership, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the leadership that is do, do, dominating uh, the, the uh, PLO. I do not have any hope in Hamas. 
that is using Gaza the way uh, Gaza is, I think we need something totally new because Hamas is a new version of Fatah with, with some uh, uh, peppers of Islam. But in Fatah, there were peppers of Islam also. You know, just people, people have no memory. <laughs> you know. So uh, it's, it's a new version, which was great at that time. Fatah played a major role, and I'm, I'm proud that I, I participated in that role. But khalas, it's over. We need something totally new with a new situation where the Arab, uh, the Arab, uh, dictator, the Arab dictatorships uh, uh, showed us the real face that they are another uh, face of, of colonialism and of Zionism where the Palestinians, they are not alone. The Palestinians are alone if they separate their struggle from the struggle of the Arab, the Arab, other Arabs for democracy. Uh, and if they separate their struggle from this struggle in the, on, on the international level for for uh, uh, equality and humanity and so on and so forth. We are not alone. This is not true. Mm -hmm. But we have to find ways to rebuild this collective uh, struggle and feeling around, around the question, around the struggle of Palestine. Yeah. And, and when you say, uh, you know, we should, min al awal, we should start from the beginning, I, I was thinking about your long time engagement, as you say, not as a politician, you're not a politician, uh, as a writer, as a novelist, uh, with the Nakba, with the events of the Nakba. And, and even uh, later on, you added another layer, kind of uh, having a dialectical relationship in the novels between the Nakba and the Holocaust, between Jewish history or, or the history of persecution of the Jews and the history of the Zionist colonization and oppression of the of the Palestinians, um, and um, I, I I like to ask you about this whole engagement with with the Nakba and the Nakba denial, and of course one of the uh, uh, I think features of dealing with the Nakba is the, the the way you and many others would refer to the Nakba as a uh, al Nakba al Mustamirra, uh, the ongoing uh, Nakba, and there's a certain sense of desperations in a way, because it seems that the most common reference to the Nakba is its persistence and constant uh, denials. Uh, and new, new novels bring it back, as did the poems of uh, Mahmoud Darwish, as did the work of the historians. Uh, before the meeting, we, we, we talked about how we were able recently to resurface the crime of the massacre that occurred in Tantura in 1948. It is a denial that is forced by the oppressor, but also is brought by the victim's inability sometimes and unwillingness maybe to speak as we learn from Danun's uh, notebooks uh, in Children of the Ghetto. Now, how much the struggle that you're talking about, and, the, and you said rightly, and I agree with you, the role that literature should, should play in that struggle in Min al Awan that you're talking about, uh, how much of it is also a struggle against the denial of the Nagba? And how much is such a struggle against denial part of decolonization, part of the struggle for liberation? And, and, and not what some people would accuse uh, uh, people who are focusing on the Nagba of being, of just having an unhealthy, nostalgic, you know, adherence uh, uh, to the past. Is it part of what Edward Said used to call uh, uh, a demand to uh, permission to narrate, or is it much more than that? Is it is it exactly what you talked about the right of return? Is it not a, a, a demand to fight against denial because we want not only acknowledgement of the crime of the Nakba, we want also accountability for the crimes committed by Israel, and we believe that rectifying them is best through the right of return. So. Is, is this something that you, uh, we should continue to focus on? Uh, and is it such an important part of our uh, uh, relationship? And if, if I can add, if you don't mind, how do you see that the, what I call the kind of dialectical connection 
between the Nakba and the Holocaust. And, and, and your involvement in this for me is a, you know, a, a very good antidote to what we are experiencing in Britain because uh, of the new IHRA definition, a criticism of Israel can be now framed as denial of the Holocaust. And, 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 and we, we are kind of, uh, it stifles our, our, the debate and our ability uh, to go on with constructive criticism of what's happening. And I just want to, to finish this rather long comment, but I really want you to talk both about the Nakba and its connection to, to, uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, from the quote from uh, uh, Danun, who says, I did not conceal my Palestinian identity, but I hid it in the Palestinian ghetto in Alid, in which I was born. I was a son of the ghetto, and it bestowed upon me the immunity of the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, to our viewers who are not familiar with the term ghetto in this context, let me just explain that the Palestinians who remained in the destroyed towns of Palestine after the Nakba were condoned in areas encircled with barbed wires, the Israelis themselves called the ghetto. So I think what Elias is doing, uh, if I understood correctly, is, is kind of you provide immunity from a certain mode of resistance in the past that persecuted Jews were using and you shield yourself by almost appropriating the term ghetto, which you didn't do yourself, the Israelis did, and you create uh, a very interesting uh, relationship as part of, I think, of a literary attempt and not political attempt to explain the importance of not denying the Nakba, commemorating it and examining its relevance for us uh, in the present. Oh my God, uh, you know, Ilan, you replied to all the questions, so I don't need to say anything. I, I agree totally with what you have said, you know. Uh, now, now, uh, just, just, uh, just uh, four, four, four or five remarks. First, just I want to, to, to um, tell you that uh, the term, uh, the ongoing Nakba, I was, I used it first uh, in, in the lecture which I gave in uh, Berlin in the Wissenschaft colleague uh, in the School for Advanced Studies in Berlin, uh, which was the, uh, the annual lecture of the school. I don't know why, have, why they have chosen me. And, uh, and the, the hall was full with, uh, with the German professors and German heads of universities and so on and so forth. It was very, very prestigious. And I, I, I read them this long uh, text, which was republished afterwards in English and in Arabic. And to my astonishment, the reaction was, first of all, nobody clapped for 10 seconds. I thought they would beat me, and then everybody did. This is another story. But the reaction was, and the, the, real, the real anger was, you are speaking about the Nakba now. The Nakba happened in 48 Khalas. There was no denial of the Nakba. They couldn't deny it. Uh, uh, but they wanted to deny that what we are living through now is a Nakba. Is, is the Nakba itself taking different forms? So the idea of the, the so the Nakba, this is what, what makes it a difference with the Holocaust. There are many differences. I, I do not compare, I do not say the Holocaust and the Nakba are the same thing. This is this is stupid and foolish. One, one of the differences is that the, the, the Holocaust happened. The Nakba is happening. This is the presence of Palestine. And I can say this is the presence of the Arabs, of the Arab majority. So it's happening now. In Sheikh Jarrah, the Nakba is happening. In Nablus, the Nakba is happening. Everywhere in Palestine, in historic Palestine, uh, in all of Palestine, yani in 48 and 67, or Gaza, the Nakba is happening. So what we are witnessing is uh, 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 the same project, which is continuing, which did not, as, as Benny Morris said, you know, your friend, <laughs> Benny Morris, when, 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 when he republished his book after the second Indifada, he said that Mingorion did a big error. He did not continue. They want to continue. Uh, Ariel Sharon, in the beginning of the second father, the first declaration of Ariel Sharon was, we are in the war of independence, which means we are in the Nakba. 
the war of independence did not finish. So there is a continuous process which is still taking place. And, and our struggle is to stop this process. The moment we stop this process, then everything will change. Now, the other thing is about, about the, uh, 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 so, so in this sense, the Nakba is not a memory. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is the present and the memory comes from the present. Now, when, when you mentioned the ghetto of Lidda, uh, there were many ghettos in Lidda and Ramli and Haifa and Yafa, and you know better than me. Uh, 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 the Palestinians who were in the ghetto heard the first time the term from the Israeli soldiers. And, and, and to my astonishment, because I made a big research with the, you know, oral, oral history and so on, to my astonishment, many people told me, isn't it the name of the Arab quarter of the Arab neighborhood? They thought this is the name of the this is the name Israel gave to the Arab court and neighborhood. So, and it was not by hazard that the Israeli soldiers called them ghettos. It was because in their uh, subconscious they knew what they were doing. These guys of Tantura, which uh, we we just we are just witnessing uh, uh, with the film and and with the revisiting the Tantura, I think. These, these criminals knew that they were criminals. They were aware of their, of their criminality. And it was not a hazard. I mean, it was, they were, as you know, there is a very beautiful novel, uh, Israeli novel, which I like very much, of Khirbet uh, Khaza by yes. Essie Zahar. And Essie Zahar was a Zionist, of course, everybody knows. Uh, but I used, I, I taught his, his novel a lot. And those who make, are making comparative literature, it's interesting. To teach, to compare Khirbet Khaza to the Palestinian literature. In Khirbet Khaza, it was published, it was written, published in 1949, that is during the War of the Nakba, during the War of Independence. Uh, uh, he describes the Palestinians who were kicked from this village, Khirbet Khaza, he called it, which was really Khirbet Lakhsas, as we know afterwards, as if they are Jews. He uses the same terms. The, the anti-Semites used to describe the Jews. So there are, they are the Jews of the Jews. So we are related, the Nakba and the Holocaust are related through this concept, the Jews and the Jews of the Jews. And it seems all societies, I mean, I'm sorry for that, but, uh, but, but all types of, 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 uh, 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 of, uh, of racial, uh, of, of racism, you need Jews. Yeah. You need your Jews. If you don't have Jews, you invent your Jews. The same way that's taking place now in Europe, they are inventing their Jews from the Muslims. You invent your Jews. So, so practically we are, you cannot understand now for the scholars of the Holocaust, it's no more possible to understand the Holocaust without understanding the Nakba or to understand the Nakba without understanding the Holocaust. This doesn't mean that this is a crime, this is a crime, khalas, we are equal. No, no, it's not true. The Holocaust is a crime which we must condemn, and the Nakba is a crime we must condemn. But the Nakba is still taking place, and the, and, and the Nakba must be accountable, as you said. Otherwise, we cannot get out from this, uh, from this vicious, stupid circle. I know this, is, this now will sound very, I mean, you are, I mean, uh, not realistic at all. Uh, I'm not real, which is true. I'm not realistic. Who said? Who said that? Said that, realism is that, good, yeah. that realism made, made history. <laughs> you need. You need. You need. Uh, you need a dream. You need a dream. You need a dream to write books. You need a dream to make a revolution. You need a dream to teach from your from deep from your deep heart. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Yeah. Otherwise, we are just uh, working to make money and then spending the money to, to, to go to the doctors, and that's it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a meaningless life. So uh, uh, what, 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 what is here, this, inter, this relationship between the Nakba and the Holocaust will open a horizon, not for reconciliation the way the Oslo Agreement thought about reconciliation, it was, it was not reconciliation. The Oslo agreements were a surrender, which was refused by the Israelis. 
uh, reconcilia deep reconciliation of accepting the other and of trying to build a new democratic place, a place where our identity, our religious identity is not the dominant identity. The dominant identity is our human identity. And this is how I, this is how I live. And this is, this is, I think, how gave me uh, uh, the potential to write a novel like uh, The Children of the Ghetto. Now I'm finishing the third. The second part is coming soon in English. Uh, mm. it's, uh, they just finished the translation. And the third volume, I'm, I'm, I'm just yesterday, <laughs> I finished it. So I was working on it. So this gave me the, the, the possibility to go through this uh, very, very dark history, which is as if you are going inside your dark self. This is the heart of darkness. This is the real heart of darkness that, that literature can help us to understand, not to solve, to understand. And then how to solve, it's up to you, up to you. The, the guys here, the new generation. They have to teach us how to solve it. Yes. Fantastic. I have a final, final question for you, Elias, and then we'll open it up for the people. Um, you, you, at the very beginning of our conversation, we, you said that the civil war in a way liberated a certain generation of Lebanese writers, you know, and uh, you connected to, to past and present events and so on. And, and that kind of reminded me, and this is my last question uh, uh, for you uh, as a novelist and, and for me who is not a novelist. Uh, I remember Isabella Allende saying once that uh, unlike uh, audiences in the West, audiences in Latin America anticipate their writers to have a certain message, ideological, moral, political. In fact, even if you write a total, you know, a Roman, a romance story, uh, you, she had the sense that the audience anticipates that within that story, there is also um, reference to, to, to political issues, ideological issues, and so on. And um, I wonder whether kind of, when you look towards the next generation of writers in, in the Arab world, uh, do you think that there is a sense that writing or the novel with all its multi-layer kind of, uh, uh, you know, objectives, as, as you once said, I want to make people to feel the joy of the novel. So it, you want to make people happy, interesting, moved and so on. But there is also the wish to, as you say, not to solve, not to offer a solution, but to illuminate a question, to expand on it. Uh, do, do you see the, the, the current kind of uh, uh, generation of writers uh, on Palestine, on Lebanon, and so on, are seeing themselves as part of liberation, uh, fighting against injustice, and so on? Or is there more maybe an escape uh, uh, to say this is so horrible or insoluble, insoluble that we don't want to be there, you know, kind of? think that uh, I was kind of wondering when I didn't see that many, uh, maybe it's too early, uh, works on, on, on the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring and its, its, its aftermath. So a kind of a final statement of, of, of the role of literature really in, 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 in a part of the world that needs decolonization, uh, probably more than many, many other parts and especially uh, desionization, decolonization, and uh, a better record of human rights and civil rights. Yes, uh, uh, look, you know, to, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, when he was speaking about translation, uh, uh, he spoke that uh, uh, translators must be poets and they must not uh, consider the audience at all. And I think, I think writing, and I, I, I really don't, don't think when I write, I don't think about the audience. I think about what I am trying to discover, what I am trying to go through, what I am trying to experience. Because in every novel, every novel is like a journey. Every novel is 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 a, a something to this, to, to know about and to discover, and then to come back and to read. It. You know, in one thousand and one night, Sindibad uh, used to go the seven the seven travels of Sindibad used to go 
uh, 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 to, to, to far places. And then and he used to go actually in order to tell it because he was a storyteller. So he came back to tell. So I go in order to tell. And I tell what I've seen. I don't tell what I think it's good. Now, uh, in Bebe Shams, to go back to Bebe Shams, um, uh, the plan of Bebe Shams, wallahi, I swear, it was to write a love story. The, the initial plan had nothing to do with Palestine. The initial plan was Yunis is living in Lebanon. He has a wife who is in Galilee. And he wants to cross the border in order, because he was in love with her, to go and meet her. And, 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 and I said to myself, this is the, the first story, because normally the story of love and literature are the story of separation. And, and you never love your wife, you love uh, someone else. Wife, so. <laughs> so here I thought we are going towards a new approach to, about love. And then when I put Eunice in his context, all of Palestine emerged. And I was obliged, you know, instead of writing the novel in one year, uh, the plan was like that, a small, a short novel about love. I, I, I spent seven, eight years in order to build the whole story. But the whole story was around love. So you discover and you witness what you are discovering. I, I think this is what, what the writer, uh, what, what literature is all about. And, and, and of course, now, now rereading reading it, in the situation I am, in the situation the text is, of course, this is part of the conversation. Because I am part of the conversation. Because I'm in, because because uh, 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 but but I do yani, I do not push the text to follow me. I follow the text. I do not teach the heroes what to say. I uh, they teach me how to speak. So it's a very it's a very complex relationship. But practically, my heroes are marginals. Uh, this is a choice. Because I feel I'm a margin, stranger, because I feel I'm a stranger. Uh, the way Adam Danin is, or the way uh, Khalil Ayyub is, and so on. And this is, I'm mentioning two, two heroes you, you, have, you have mentioned. Uh, because this is how I am. This is how I feel. This is how I, I identify with. Now, I think that the, uh, in the Mashriq, we are witnessing, you know, the, for example, the Syrian novel, there is a huge. Uh, a huge uh, uh, innovation, which happened after the, the uh, uh, actually since 12 years, uh, since the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. It's amazing how the, the Syrian novel became so much central in the, in the Syrian culture. How the Iraqi novel, the same, the same road that the Lebanese novel took uh, 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 for 50 years ago. So, no, I, I'm, I'm, I think I, I'm, I'm a reader and, 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 and these young, new writers, I learn from them. I do not teach them. And when I read them, I'm so happy. Now, many of them, as you said, they feel that it's too much. You have to go aside. Why not? I, I, I think you cannot go aside. I think wherever you are, wherever you we are witnessing it. You asked me at the beginning about Beirut, personally about Beirut. This is the, the first time in my life I feel that I am in, an ex, in exile when I'm in Beirut. The exile became part, in, an interior part of our lives. Whether we are in Beirut or in Baghdad or in Damascus or in Paris or in London or wherever, or in Berlin now, because Berlin is a la mode now. All the intellectuals go to Berlin. Whenever we are, we are in exile. And I think this experience of the literature of, 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 of exile will give something new, which I don't know what. But there is something profoundly new which is which is beginning. And 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 I'm 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 very enthusiastic to read. Uh, uh, because practically, practically, who is a writer? A writer is the leader. 
you read you read uh, you read uh, uh, the reality and, and and you translate it so you are a reader and a translator uh, 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 and and when you when you read when you read a novel or you read a, a, a poem when i when i go back to my to my great uh, friend and personal poet mahmoud darwish from time to time uh, uh, I, I feel I feel as if as if as if I am I am I am I am I am taking all the language, not only Arabic. I'm really taking all the languages. In one language, you feel all the languages. You feel the the ancient languages, which were dominant in our part of the world, especially the Aramaic, the Syriac, uh, and then the Hebrew, and so on. And and you take the modern languages. So in one poem you can incarnate the whole world. In one novel, the whole world will come and, 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 be, and you'll be part of it. I don't know. I, I, did I reply? I don't know. I, 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 anyway. anyway. Yes. Oops. Yes, you did. You did. I, I, I definitely. Uh, you took us for, for a longer journey than I thought, but a very rewarding one. Uh, uh, we, we really have to give the floor. People are eager to ask us uh, questions. And uh, we forgot for a moment that there are other people there. So we are back into reality. And I think I'm going back to Tina. Is that right? For, for our Q&A session? Or... It's, it's Actually, me. Bria. To Bria. 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 Thank you, Professor Pape and Professor Khoury uh, for the great conversation. Talk, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so for me, I would use my position uh, now to ask my own question. <laughs> um, uh, as I know, like from that, there is uh, some Palestinian activists who actually built um, new camps on the like, like inspired by the by your novel Baba Shams and named it Baba Shams, um, and reconstructed this uh, narrative of the novel. To you, what is the importance of literature for recovery or healing for the marginalized communities as a whole, in the sense of preserving what happened and attributing responsibility for the pain? You know, I didn't want to mention this because I, 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 I uh, it's it's so sensitive and so important for me. Uh, I've never I've never witnessed something like that. Because normally literature and reality uh, becomes literature. We pick from reality and we make what we do and then uh, and imagine and so on, and literature will come. This was the first time that I saw that literature is becoming a reality. This group of youngsters in Palestine who went to E1, which is a region uh, near Jerusalem, confiscated in order to build uh, to build uh, colonies uh, Israeli colonies on it when they went there and created a village they called they, they created a village with tents that they called it Beth Shams for me I, I really felt that that I can die after that after that what a writer will, will dream more this is the best thing you can have and I felt really really at that moment, that they own the novel, that took that they took the novel from me. I'm no more the author. They are the author, and 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 that I, 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 it's, it's very emotional because because I spent three days with them on Skype, the whole day, the whole night, and and I felt profoundly how. How words are alike. Words are like human beings. They are like us. We have to, to deal with words. They are very fragile. They are they are like us as human beings. They feel, and and they must be well treated and loved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um. We have now a question um, from Daniel Bugal Shunra um, for our speakers. Would you agree um, that the expansion of the concept of anti-Semitism to include anti-Zionism is an attempt to make it look as if the Holocaust, like the Nakba, 
is an ongoing event still taking place. Uh, it's long, I think. Yeah, I, and I, I'll start and give you some space to breathe. Uh, thank you for, for the question. I, I, I think that uh, the main uh, uh, attempt by equating anti Semitism with criticism on Israel or criticism on Zionist ideology as a racist ideology. I think the main attempt is to weaponize anti Semitism in order to stifle the debate on Palestine and to um, uh, prevent criticism and condemnation, international condemnation of Israel. The, the, uh, I, I see the, the uh, what you're talking about, the, the, the insertion of the Holocaust into this, uh, which was not there before, let's say in 2005, uh, when the Israeli Ministry of Propaganda or Ministry of Strategic Affairs, as it was called, began to accuse anyone criticizing uh, Israel as being anti-Semitic or a self-hating Jew, in, in my case. Um, it, it was not immediately uh, connected to the denial of, of the Holocaust. Uh, I, I think that uh, because this first uh, weapon, if you want, misfired, it didn't work. Uh, the civil society continued to condemn Israel. People knew too much. And while governments may have not changed the policies toward Israel, civil society became much more aware and much more assertive in its support, for instance, for campaigns like the BDS. And that's when Israel decided to use another weapon by, by kind of creating this association of Holocaust denial and criticizing uh, Israel. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, the Palestinians are the successor of the Nazis uh, is not new in Israel. Uh, there was a very good book by uh, an Israeli scholar called Edith Zertal, and also the Israeli journalist Tom Segev wrote about it in a book called The Seven Millions, uh, all the time kind of uh, uh, trying to equate Palestinian resistance to the old European anti-Semitism that bred uh, Nazism. I don't think many, many people in the world with a modicum of intelligence and the knowledge buy into it anymore. And it looks much more pathetic in my eyes than it looked before. What it does do, and that's what I learned from the IHRA business in Britain, it's not that people are convinced that uh, uh, condemning Israel or Zionism is really Holocaust denial. I don't think anyone believes in it but they are afraid of being called Holocaust deniers. So it's a useful weapon in intimidating people, but not winning the moral debate about Zionism and Israel. And therefore, unlike some of my colleagues, I am less intimidated and terrified by it because I think it's so illogical. It's so, uh, uh, in many ways, stupid that uh, uh, yes, it can intimidate, it can frighten. I doubt whether it has long sh shelf life uh, given uh, the very precarious, uh, you know, foundation on which it is based. You know, I agree. <laughs> Good to know. I mean, uh, what shall I say after this? Yes. Well, can move to another question, that's great. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, so we're going to Hadil Abu Hussein question uh, on Zoom. It will be great to hear you both opinion in regard of the ongoing struggle of Sheikh Jarrah and the reaction from all the Palestinian people uh, everywhere. Uh, can we consider it as a starting point towards new narrative of, of Palestinian people? Elias, please. No, no, no. Uh, yes, of course, the struggle of Sheikh Jarrah is very important, is very essential, is central. But in your discourse, of course not. This is part of, of the struggle against, uh, against, uh, uh, against uh, colonialism, against, against uh, appropriation of land and property, which, uh, which Israel has been doing since 1948. The new thing in it, is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the guys uh, in Sheikh Jarrah, and this is something new and we have to appreciate this, 
used used uh, social media in a very intelligent way in order to create a huge uh, public opinion around around their case and this is a lesson for all of us that we are living in a new world and we have to use new me new methods the old methods alone cannot work anymore so in this sense it's very important now now um, uh, uh, the unification of the Palestinian people. Now, this is because the, 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 the militants of Sheikh Ra were able to, to create a big public opinion around their cause, they reunited Palestine. This is one of the rare cases where the Palestinians of 48, the Palestinians of Gaza, the Palestinians of the West Bank, and the Palestinians of the refugee camps abroad and the Palestinians in the in the in the uh, 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 all over the world were united, and this is the, this lesson takes us back to this idea that only real resistance can reunite the Palestinian people and can recreate uh, a new a new wave of struggle. Uh, can can give back the dream to the people who deserve this dream. Yeah, I, I totally agree uh, with Elias. So just very two short points. One is, I think that uh, um, it. I think the Sheikh Jarrah, uh, um, the context in which in which the international community studied Sheikh Jarrah, it, for me, it was one of the first time that uh, an event. Uh, in the international media was seen in a wider context. So, so people were paying attention to the fact that the same ideology that caused for the, caused the uh, expulsion of the Palestinians in 1948 is the same ideology that leads to the ethnic cleansing that is taking place now in East Jerusalem. And I think it's one of the reasons, and I talked to some people in Amnesty, it's one of the reasons that eventually Amnesty decided to publish its report of Israel as an apartheid state. You reach, and I know there's a lot of Palestinian and, 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 and the right, right Palestinian criticism on it, but, but we should not underestimate its importance. And, and, one, and this is what's going, is happening now, which is encouraging, but time will tell whether Palestinians will know how to exploit it uh, in the liberation struggle. What is happening now, is that, that the historical perspective of what Elias talked before about the Nagba Mustamirra is now clearer to people, maybe because there is much more information about the different dots on that history. You know, the ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem in 48, ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem in 1967, ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem today. It is a structure, it's an ideological structure. It's not the policy of one Israeli government and then there is another nicer Israeli government. No, there is a, an ideology which we call Zionism that produces these policies and the Palestinians are the main victims of these policies. So I think in that respect, the Hadil, uh, Sheikh Jarrah was important. Secondly, as, as, as Eli has pointed out, it was really 11 days of unity which uh, uh, made us all very proud. I, I, I was lucky enough to be in, in Haifa in, in those 11 days and, and see the youth uh, uh, working together. As an historian, I know that it's very difficult to know in terms of the history of liberation, whether something is an anecdote or something is a precursor of something much bigger to come. And this, of course, we don't know. And we just have to hope that that kind of unity that comes from below and not from above is the one that would determine the agenda uh, uh, for the future. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go now to a question from um, Asha Ali. Um, would professors um, Khoury and Pape have any thoughts on the current situation in Lebanon and the future tra trajectory, um, the efforts to establish a civil state? Um, sorry, I have... Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm reading from here and I've kind of um, um, got, got myself a little bit lost. I'll start again. So um, would the professors Khoury and Pape have any thoughts on the current situation in Lebanon and the future trajectory, the efforts to establish a civil state? What does this 
effort mean, not just for Lebanese citizens, but also for Palestinian refugees who have so far been excluded from civil society? Yes, it's for you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, the first, uh, in the situation in Lebanon is, uh, is very gloomy. I, mean, I, don't, I, I see it very black. But, but there are some, some light somewhere. And this light comes from, uh, first of all, the feeling we had during the Intifada of October 17th, where there was a real popular unity which went beyond uh, this sectarian and confessional vision, which was, which was profound and authentic. Uh, actually, it was destroyed. It was destroyed uh, for many reasons. One major one of them, the oppression, which took many forms, militias, uh, the uh, police, uh, shooting, and so on and so forth, but also intimidation, and the feeling that, uh, that uh, there is no support from anywhere. And if there is support coming from places which we do not want the support to come from, and that is the Americans and the Europeans, which makes us feel very, very bad. <laughs> and we know that it's not support. It's profoundly not support. Now, now in this, uh, in this uh, uh, light we saw there was embryos of a struggle for a new embryos for uh, 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 a civil secular uh, society. Now this uh, represented itself in the elections of the students in all the universities, what, what, what we call the uh, secular clubs, you know, uh, uh, wiped out. Uh, the, all the parties of the of the dominant of the dominant uh, 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 oligarchy, from from Mustaqbal uh, of Al Hariri to Amal to Hezbollah to uh, Lebanese forces to Kataib and so on and so forth. It was unbelievable, and 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 it had a big potentiality. But this is not the end of the story. This is. I cannot say even this is the beginning. This is the entrance to the beginning of the story. So it's a long, long struggle because Lebanon, as, as I said, is a very small country surrounded by dictators. And we are now in the, in the jaw of uh, the Saudis, who you know their uh, love to democracy. Uh, uh, with the story, of, I, I, at least, uh, the Khashoggi story shows us the love to democracy. And on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the Iranians who, who are trying to expand. Uh, and, 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 and unfortunately, uh, uh, we do not feel identification with the uh, resistance movement that is Hezbollah, because I never, I never believe that one confession group can lead a national liberation movement. So we are in, uh, in a long, long struggle. But in this struggle, the problem is that there is a, a, a huge human uh, catastrophe, and poverty, and unfortunately, a, a, a huge uh, immigration, especially from the new generations. And this new immigration began to happen after the explosion of the uh, of August the fourth in the port of Beirut, where one third of the city was destroyed. And 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 our home, I was at home, and and glasses and <laughs> and and, uh, and doors fell upon our heads, uh, and there were there were two hundred people killed and six thousand injured. After that, we felt that they can kill us in our home. So, but you know, this is history. I mean, I mean, this is history. History is uh, not beautiful. I'm sorry to say that revolution. You know, revolution is beautiful in books. It's not beautiful in reality. And I'm sorry to say that. And, and history is beautiful in books because you know, you speak about the invasion of the Mongols to Baghdad or about the Crusaders uh, in, in a history book, uh, three pages. 
And then you, <laughs> you continue. It's not three pages. It's 150 years. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's generation who are destroyed. So unfortunately, we are in a situation like that. I'm sorry. That's no, no, no need to Thank you. Uh, we will go to the next question by, uh, we have uh, Sharita on Zoom. Uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced the name wrong way. So this question is both, uh, for both speakers. You talked about writing for liberation and justice. As Palestinians, we are denied access not only to our ancestral villages, but to our visual history. When trying to reconstruct the stories of our villages, in my case, in the form of cinema, how does the denial of access to many aspects of our histories impact on the possibilities of writing for liberation? Uh, Thank you. I can start. Um, first of all, I think you're right. I, I think that uh, denial is uh, in the case of an ongoing ethnic cleansing, we talked about the ongoing Nakba, is all kinds of erasures I mean, we talked about different phases of ethnic cleansing, but there are also continuous uh, projects of erasure. It begins by uh, flattening the Palestinian villages and building on them Jewish colonies or planting on them European trees and making them recreational parks in 1948. But then it continues into expunging the Palestinian from the history of Palestine and history books uh, in uh, the Western media, uh, cinema, and, and, and academia. Uh, and uh, this continues with the kind of denials of access that you were uh, talking about. But I want to point out to the, maybe another side of that struggle that, and, and to think aloud whether we can enhance this, this other side and make it a more effective even. As you know, uh, despite the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, half of the Palestinians are still in historical Palestine. And there are Palestinians, the 48 Arabs, who are inside uh, the part of Palestine where the Nakba occurred. And the young Palestinian society there is engaged in cultural struggle. They are visiting and revisiting places that were destroyed. Uh, there, there is a, a project called Udna, where they reconstruct uh, how the villages looked like and how they think the villages would look like should the right of return be implemented. Uh, and, and I think that we should not allow the uh, geographical fragmentation that was imposed by Zionism to create a fragmentation in the joint cultural struggle to work against the erasure, to work against uh, the, the denial. So, so I really think that where you can fight the denial if you are there should be connected to the struggle against denial among people who are denied access to Palestine or access to, to material. As, as you probably know, in 2016, Israel began to uh, close uh, the documents from 1948 for fear that given the fact that in the past these documents uh, uh, contributed to a different version of events of 1948 with the hope that if they close the archives, uh, no more critical works on Israel's role in the Nakba would appear, which was a stupid act and, and did not at all stop the research. You don't only need Israeli documentation to know what happened in 48 and after 1948. Uh, I myself, I really believe that we, we need in, in London, for instance, I'm, I'm dreaming about it in many ways, a center against Nakba denial, a, a physical place. You have so many center against Holocaust denial around the world. We need one against the Nakba denial in order to, to engage in that rebuilding the connection where the connection is unavoidable. So I think, yes, the crime of denial and erasure is there, but I don't think we have to be passive and say that we don't have means of struggling against it. Uh, we have been fighting against it, we are fighting against it, and probably we could do much better and more if we'll think together how to do this, given the fact that still so many Palestinians are still there on the ground. And there is a group, a small group, it's not a very big group, 
but there, are, there is a group of conscientious Israeli Jews uh, in an NGO called Zuchrot, remembering, who are very willing to help in this as well. So maybe there are kinds of alliances that can help to make sure that this particular part of the crime would not be successful forever. Yes, uh, just one, one thing. You are totally right uh, that um, it's very difficult, that we do not have access, that uh, things, many, many things were erased. But this difficulty must give us uh, uh, power to struggle. Because it's very difficult, we have to work hard. I just remember just to tell you that uh, uh, when, when I published the first volume of Aula Ghetto, The Children of the Ghetto, many people came and told me, Shuhai the Ghetto, they are Palestinians. They never heard of the Ghetto. I told them, Ya Habibi, just and if you can go to, 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 to Israel, uh, to Palestine, Israel, just uh, come down in the, in the Lidda airport, now they call it Ben Gurion, and take a cab from there and tell him, I want to go to Lidda to the Arab Ghetto, and he will take you. So what, what do you mean you didn't know? We have to know. We have to know. We have to discover. We have to search. We are facing a terrible colonial project. Yani when, 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 when Ilan before spoke about the Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism and so on, we are facing a huge machine. It's a huge machine. Look, look in Germany, what they are doing with the, with the journalists that uh, mention anything about Palestine in their Facebook pages, uh, Arab journalists. So it's very difficult. It's our struggle is very difficult. It's a struggle of life or death. So what do you expect? We have to fight till the end. And as Iran said, one of the major hopes, not only that we can rebuild the past or rebuild what's going on now in the present, but one of the major uh, reasons that make the right of return possible is because the Palestinians are in Palestine. This is not a utopia. The Palestinians are not in, I don't know where, in the whole world. The Palestinians are in Palestine. Seven million Palestinians live in Palestine. So they give us, they give us the possibility to make the right of return real and political right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, we, we, we're running over, um, over time and we've got a lot of questions, but I think that um, everyone will probably want to bear with me if we have just one more um, very important one um, from Elias Khalil um, for both of our speakers. So on the need to dream and imagine to bring about revolutions, what do our speakers dream about when it comes to Lebanon, at Lebanon and Palestine? <laughs> I really want Elias to have the last word as our guest of honor. So I will be brief Habib, and Habib, allow Elias to- Habib uh, Ilan, I, I think, I, think I, I share with you the same dream. Oh, I, I think we do. Uh, I, I will talk about, yeah, I will talk about dream about Palestine very shortly and, and pass the one to, 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 uh, to Elias, my dear friend. Uh, you know, I, I, I started, I, I like the question because I started a page book called Liberation 2048. I try to imagine myself, uh, uh, I, I learned afterwards that I don't know how to calculate. I thought I would be 103. My son told me, no, you're wrong, you'll be 96. I, I'm very bad with this. But I, I kind of imagine 2048 as my best scenario because I deal so much with worst case scenarios. I, I thought maybe I should free my imagination. What would be the best case? What, what am I dreaming? about. And, and instead of having a big stroke, you know, like saying this would be the nature of the regime, all the refugees coming back, uh, a, a democracy, a equality, and so on, which of course is part of the mixture of, of that dream, I, I decided to break it down to small dreams of stations on the way to be more realistic in a way, in, in, an, in a totally unrealistic way. And I was thinking about something Elias was saying about uh, what he felt 
when the six uh, political prisoners escaped from the Gilboa a prison uh, a war. And I said to myself, this particular event of the escape and the capture of the people, for me defined exactly who are my allies within the Israeli Jewish society. It's not asking them 25 questions to see whether they are with me in the definition of Zionism and so on, no. It was, did they feel any sense of joy when, the, when they heard about the escape? And did they feel deep sorrow when they heard about the capture of these people? It is on the emotional level that, that I, I, I think that's where my imagination works, where what for me are obvious human reactions to the, uh, the escape, to the brutality in Sheikh Jarrah or in 1948, that these kinds of reactions would not be for the very few who would regard it either as lunatics or as traitors or self-hating Jews. Uh, because I cannot imagine exactly how it would be built. But on the basis of these, trans in this transformation of human, of human reaction to the reality, I think that there is a sense that something different uh, can happen. Because the other way of changing the reality that totally disregards a change, which I can fully understand, let's say you say, I don't care. I don't, the Israeli Jews will never change and I don't care and will defeat them. Unfortunately, from history, I know that this kind of revolution and transformation is quite bloody usually, and nobody gets out of it very well, even if liberation is, is achieved. So my dream is liberation through the liberation of people who are captivated with the wrong feeling and ideology in enough numbers to create a new reality. So as I said, uh, we share the dream. Uh, my dream, um, since here I am both Lebanese and Palestinian, my dream for Lebanon is, uh, is, is to survive. You see, it's a very, very, very lewd dream. My dream is to survive, to survive this catastrophic situation and to build up mechanisms of resistance uh, uh, against the oligarchy that is destroying our society. And for Palestine, it's the same dream. My dream is to build new consciousness between the Palestinians and the Israeli Jews. A consciousness of the need of justice and equality. Equality is the key word. If we don't speak about equality, we are speaking about nothing. If we are equals, then we have to, have to behave uh, accordingly. And in this sense, all the other problems will find their solution. The refugees will return, uh, 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 a, a deep uh, accountability will take place, and the reconciliation will take place. But this idea of justice is a major idea, which we must stick on when we, when we dream about Palestine and about uh, the future. Now, of course, Ilan is more... Uh, uh, has bigger imagination than me, his dream of 2048. I'm sure I'll not be here at 2048. Uh, but being here or not, live, alive or dead, we both, the living and the dead, have the right to dream and to communicate and to think about this future, which we are hoping to arrive to it, was impossible without those who learned, who taught us how to write, how to speak, how to struggle, how to defend ourselves with a very, very, very big prices they have paid. 
And with this color, shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elias. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Uh, 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 talking about dreams is um, a wonderful way uh, and very poetic way to end this wonderful conversation with Professor uh, Khoury and Professor Fafé. Thank you so much uh, again. It's a great honor to have uh, you all attent uh, attentive and tuned in. Thank you for spending your much valuable time to present here, to be present here and make this talk memorable. Uh, I will pass this over to Katie to, thank you so much. Just falls to me to say, say goodbye. And again, thank you to our guests, to our chairs, to the incredible global audience that's with us here tonight. Um, the recording of this talk will be up on the IAS YouTube channel. Um, if anyone needs the direct link, you can send me a message at the EDN Gmail um, account, which is on the Eventbrite page. But that's, that's all we have for this evening. Um, thank you again um, for everything, for the dreams and the vision. Um, yeah, for everything. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, Elias. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ilan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next, you next, next year in Jerusalem. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> in the free and democratic and equal Jerusalem. Right. <laughs>